Our fugitive has been on the run for 90 minutes. What I want out of each and every one of you is a hard target search of every gas station, residence, warehouse, farmhouse, hen house, outhouse, or dog house in that area. Your fugitive's name is Dr. Richard Kimball. Go get him. This was an uphill climb from the very beginning. Uh, I was in uh, the development of the script for uh, five and a half years. Uh, we went through nine writers, at least 25 different screenplays. The original script uh, that we were handed had been through several uh, permutations. It had been uh, in the hands of another director for a while. And it was so far-fetched, I think, that uh, the version I first read, Tommy Lee Jones had hired the one-armed man to kill Harrison because Harrison had messed up an operation on his wife after he had beat her up. And there were times that um, everyone would say, you're wasting your time, why are you doing this? You're wasting money. Uh, Warner Brothers put the property into turnaround. They too were concerned because uh, we had spent about $2 million in, in writing costs and they were concerned that uh, this would not ever bear, bear out. And I said, listen, I have a, um, an instinct about this. My gut tells me that this is uh, going to be a success. Rarely do you work on a movie where you have the kind of involvement and support of a star like Harrison and the support of the studio. There really was never a budget. There was really never a script for this movie. They just said, we want you guys to make the best movie you can out of this, and we want it for next summer. Harrison Ford was my first choice. When I finally had a draft that I thought was uh, respectable enough that I could show uh, Mr. Ford, I gave it to his uh, manager, uh, Patricia McQueenie, and she read it over a weekend, and she came back and said, you know, Harrison has always wanted to do this, and this screenplay is really quite good, and it's good enough to give to him. Uh, I said, thank you so much, and she gave it to him, and he came back and said, I'm going to do it, but it, it needs work, but I want to work with you on it, and let's make this movie. And the next job we had was to get a director. I got a call from either Arnold or one of the executives, uh, Lucy Fisher, Bruce Berman, saying, uh, uh, Harrison wants to meet with you tomorrow, because Harrison had gone to scene on, see under siege in Jackson Hole, I believe, over the weekend. and. Um, um, you know, I had been working for a year on this movie, I was ready to take a break, and then the opportunity came up to work on, on The Fugitive with Harrison, and I, of course I couldn't say no to that, and I was very, very flattered and touched that he wanted me to do it. Well, I'd seen the script uh, maybe three or four times over the period of the last five or six years. I'd gone through a variety of changes, and this time it seemed to be very close to, a, to a, an exciting audience kind of film. Of course, we then took it all apart and, and did a lot of rewrites on it. Um, and we were under the gun throughout the filming to um, keep up with it script-wise. When we finally started the movie, we had three acts, but the third act couldn't be shot. We had sequences where we had uh, Gerard in, a, in an automobile going down into a subway and driving on the tracks chasing a train that Kimball was in. No one saw how they could possibly do this. I would get into a hotel room and write script and try to come up with what we were gonna shoot when we were ready. And I remembered it was a, um, a small hotel room, but we had cards all over the walls depicting every scene in the movie. Because when you move a scene or you create a new scene, Invariably, it destroys something in an earlier act. At the train crash, the live stunt is Harrison jumping off the train. The dam is Harrison jumping in the close. If you then drop to a dummy, the dummy hits the water. Plop, we have a shot, which we shot back in Los Angeles in the swimming pool at Warner Brothers studio. They have a swimming pool, and Harrison came over one day when he was in town. And he just said, well, I'll just tussle with the camera. And he literally jumped into the pool off the diving board with the cameraman, holding the camera. <laughs> and he tussled around in the water, and we had some aerators in there, and it was one cut of that. It's a tiny little cut. It's in the movie. Man, what are you out of your mind? He's dead! I gotta make him easy to catch! We're filming at the hospital. Harrison's gotten a, 
the railroad man out and he says he's in fit here and then the doctors say how does he know that and then Harrison jumps in the van we've got other stuff to do from in the hospital and Harrison says to Andy why don't you let me go with a cameraman and I'll just do it myself so Harrison Ford drove off in the ambulance just as a normal citizen <laughs> with a cameraman sitting behind him he was just he was going for it he was absolutely going for it. And it's, it's, I mean, you couldn't have choreographed it any better. But it's all Harrison. Harrison in the, in the van driving himself. But that's who he is. I am the future. Yeah. All right, please, please. We felt for a major motion picture, we wanted someone like Tommy Lee that could bring a very physical and dynamic presence to the screen. I wouldn't want to be chased by Tommy Lee Jones. So he showed up not dead yet. Let that be a lesson to you boys and girls. Don't ever argue with the big dog. Big dog is always right. <laughs> Tommy Lee Jones uh, uh, became Marshall Gerard by uh, having this ensemble of great actors around him who he could be the boss of. When we first started the project, uh, there were some questions why we needed all these marshals around Tommy. And I, because he, I felt he made him more of a leader. Sammy. Yeah. When I die, I want to come back just like you. No, you mean happy and handsome? Tommy Lee's a wonderful actor, and uh, he really takes his uh, story obligations very seriously. He creates a character that helps tell a story, and he does it in a very unique and powerful way. It was like a classic line that's quoted all the time, especially by kids, and uh, written on the spot by Tommy that morning. Newman? Yes, sir. What are you doing? I'm thinking. Well, think me up a cup of coffee and a chocolate donut with some of those little sprinkles on top, will you? And he had his own kind of attitude about the character. He was like, a, as my friend uh, Paul Brickman, the writer, said, Tommy Lee Jones and the Fugitive is a force of nature. So I've never worked with Harrison. I wanted to do that. I'm, I've always had a good time working with Andy Davis, and uh, all the uh, everything added up just fine. You never know what Tommy Lee is going to say or do. Uh, he's extremely bright, uh, very quick thinking, and has a sense of humor, and a very wry sense of humor at times. Tommy likes to play with the lines, and you know, when he gets out and says, well, 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 that's not in the script. I mean, it's all Tommy. Excuse me, Sam. Oh, wow, gee whiz, look here. Hold him up there, come on. Right, uh, come on. You know, we're always fascinated when we find leg irons with no legs in them. He got the Academy Award for this role. I mean, you know, it, it was spectacular. Can you hear what I'm saying now? Yeah. I don't bark it. You hear that? Yeah. Good. Roll, Sam. We're rolling! The man had the ability to handle a big budget movie. But more importantly, Andy Davis is a fine human being, and he's a collaborative human being. I will not work with a director that does not let me into the creative process. So working with Andy, I have the ability to express my views, to have a thorough consideration, and to feel that I am being listened to, and that some, if not many, of my ideas will be on film. Andy has um, had a great success with Under Siege, which, which I saw and, and thought was a very good uh, action-adventure film. And it had uh, some humanity and humor. We had a good time working together. Andy's a, a good friend. And if uh, I, I always need a job, if he has something for me to do, I'm, I'm going to step right up and, and do it. And he shoots from the hip. Just rush rock and roll. Harrison met me at the airport in Jackson Hole with Lucy Fisher, and he said to me, the first things were going to Chicago. I was born and raised in Chicago, but I hadn't been back in, in 10 or 15 years, and uh, it, it, was, uh, it was great fun to be back in Chicago. If you look back over the films I've made, and in in even Ebert's even talked about it several times, is that the, the location becomes a character in the movie, and, and that definitely was in my mind for this. Um, the idea of, of this little character being lost in this maze of humanity, trying to hide and, and discover, was the basis for those aerials that we used in the picture. That you see this, this city from above, and where is this, this man that Tommy Lee Jones is searching for, and where is this, this lost soul trying to f discover uh, you know, what happened to his wife and why he was framed. <laughs>
The locations are critical, and we spend quite a lot of time looking at locations and making the right decision wherever possible. I think that all locations in the future are just as perfect as it can be. We're actually in the Hall of Justice in Chicago, but we're using this to double for a federal prison where Dr. Kimball, Harrison Ford, uh, is looking for a one-armed man. He's, he has some idea that he may be in jail here in the Cook County uh, Jailhouse. And uh, the United States Marshal Service has come to the same conclusion from uh, different evidence, and they, their paths happen to cross right here. And somewhere after that, there's a chase that the audience will never forget. A wax bullet is put into the cylinder. The cylinders are electrically fired in any order we would like them to be in. We have a laser sight. We slide this on and it creates a laser beam and you can see on our target exactly where we want the bullets to be. We have the ability to be over Tommy Lee's shoulder, looking down his barrel and seeing Tommy Lee and uh, Richard Kimball in the same shot and for Tommy to fire the weapon and for the bullet to discharge at exactly the same moment. Well, this is strictly an Andy Davis moment. It's not in the script. I wanted to shoot St. Patrick's Day Parade as part of the fabric of Chicago because it's huge. They dye the river green, you know, everybody gets off of school almost, you know, it's, it's a major event. We had no idea that we were going to do this. And there we were in Chicago in, in March. And um, the parade was coming up. And he said, you know, we're going to, you know, the parade, we should shoot the parade. I thought to myself, Parade. What are we going to do with the parade? So I contact the parade and I said, look, we'd like to do some sort of wild second unit, unrehearsed stuff with the parade. And the parade guys said, yeah, but you know, you can't interrupt the parade. So we had a couple of steady cam cameras, a couple of fixed cameras. Instead of doing a French Connection type chase through the streets, I said, why don't we use the St. Patrick's Day parade to get this needle in the haystack idea across again? This man getting lost in humanity. And it was very funny because uh, uh, it's not something you sort of do. You run around with two major movie stars and cameras through the city in the middle of a St. Patrick's Day parade. And so we film in the morning to, to get the work the, the, the company's paying us to do done and then head over to the parade. We had an early call. We got almost the whole day's work done but so we could do the parade because we hadn't shared. It wasn't scheduled. It's, I mean, the studio were not get like going to... We aren't going to call them and say, look, we need some extra dough to shoot the parade. They're not going to go for that. I mean, you know, you've got to do it within your day's work. The way we did it, we shot it all live, totally unrehearsed. The actors just got in the street and did it. We uh, didn't stage anything. I just inserted myself in the middle of the, of the parade, and we grabbed some, some free shots. And it was a pretty interesting way to work. And actually, the, because I, I had black hair and, and looked uh, a little different, I wasn't really recognized for a, a little, a little while. But we were able to get what we needed uh, before that actually happened. So it was all dependent on two things. Uh, Michael Chapman, the DP, had to be ready to, with certain camera positions, and Steve St. John, who's this incredible steady cam operator who I've worked with on almost all my movies, was able to run around in freezing cold and keep up with the foot traffic with this steady cam. Is it moving at four miles an hour? I mean, so you, you, we don't see it until it's right there. It's not like we got somebody up the road and say, oh, there's the bagpipers are coming now. So, so it was just, it was strictly impromptu. And Tommy, when he jumps up at the end of the parade, looking at, looking at, 
all genius, and it's all genius stuff. Yeah, when we get into the tunnel where, where Tommy comes in and says, we got to go for it, and he goes down the tunnel. The tunnels inside, we built on that. And we built them with traps that could open up, so if we wanted to light you know, the round tunnel and a section would lift up. We never lit it, and he doesn't, and he likes the feeling of the containment. The Alcoa company that owned the dam, we were shooting all the wide shots and all the exterior stuff. You know, I said, look, we, we'd love to have you guys, but we don't want you here for a lifetime, so can you do it in one day? They had a section of set, which was the pipe, and they took it and, and uh, rigged it on top of, uh, of the dam, uh, extending over the lip of the dam, uh, so that the camera was able to be placed behind me, and, and the real background was there. And I had a safety wire that ran down the, the lowest part of the, of the sewer pipe and went up my pants to a safety belt underneath, so... I felt comfortable enough standing uh, quite close to the edge. So I thought to myself, well, how am I going to do this? So we figured out a way that we could have a flatbed truck. And we built a section on the flatbed truck. And we built it on a pivot so that we literally could drive the flatbed onto the top of the dam and pivot the entire top section of the tunnel around. And there's our set. We put some leggings on it, and we just went and started shooting. I mean, it was going to take weeks to build this thing, so I said, we just do it on a truck. And we finished, we let the water out, we had an arrangement, it was downhill, let water go through it. And when we finished, we just pulled it back and drove it off. What happened? Where'd it go? I got you a Peter Pan right here off of this dam, right here. What? Yeah, boom! The making of this movie um, is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And the freedom I had to mold a movie I think is unique. When you make a movie, you don't know that you're making The Fugitive. You know you're making a movie with Harrison Ford and it. it's called The Fugitive. And you know you've got a train sequence you're working very hard on to make special, and you've got a damn sequence, and you've got the end of the movie, and you've got, you know, two great actors in it. You're not really sure that you're going to wind up with a fugitive. I mean, I'd run, be running the studio if I could figure that out. The work experience to me was a very gratifying one because, uh, <clears throat> because Whatever the extension conditions were, I felt that we overcame them, usually at the last moment. You know, it's often the most uh, difficult circumstances that produce um, uh, some of the best movies. James Newton Howard's music, I think, was an integral part of the success of the movie. And we ended up with something that I'm extremely proud of. We hoped to make a successful motion picture. We didn't have any idea we nominated for Best Picture. And the fact it was nominated, I think, for seven Academy Awards, you know, including Best Picture, was a real thrill for all of us. The fact that Tommy Lee Jones won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor was, uh, you know, it was the third movie I'd done with Tommy. And it was a great cap to a, a, a tremendous experience. You must know the difference between illusion and reality by now. <laughs> well, I just hope that uh, I have the opportunity uh, to make another fugitive type movie in the sense of the, the wealth of the experience and the success of the experience. I thought you didn't care. I don't. <laughs>